we're going to move forward now with a quick look at the high leverage teaching practices, just in case not everybody happened to have read the book, which is understandable. Um, so high leverage teaching practices are basically a series of six practices or approaches that teachers take that powerfully support learning. They are not able to be learned um, strictly through modeling and observation. And part of that is because they are so complex. So they need to be deconstructed and they need to be explicitly taught and practiced in order to be developed. And they can be rehearsed and coached. But one really important distinction that is critical to highlight is that they are not the same thing as best practices. Um, as uh, Balam Forzani said, these high leverage teaching practices are core tasks that teachers must execute in order for students to learn. So these are so integral to instruction that they can't be set apart as innovative pockets of best practices teaching because these practices really need to occur in every classroom or learning situation. And today in our, um, in our webinar, we'll be focusing on the first three of the six high leverage teaching practices. So I'm going to give a brief orientation to high leverage teaching practice one, and then we will actually have an interview with um, our guests with Rachel and Adam in order to connect that practice directly back to high quality project based language learning. So here we go. Uh, the first one is called facilitating target language comprehensibility. And there's actually, as they said, all of these are complex. So there's really quite a bit here, but to synthesize it down as much as possible. Um, essentially, that means three things, creating comprehensible language, creating context for comprehension, and creating comprehensible interactions. So the first one, creating comprehensible language, starts with a deep understanding and application of the concept of input plus one, um, so that we can't just stay at the level where the students are because they can't ever grow. So our input our use of the target language as teachers in everything we do but especially in targeted lessons where we're trying to teach them a new um, set of words functional chunks to use needs to be just beyond where they are at right now and creating comprehensible language also means that the language learning experiences are rich in authentic resources as opposed to just being charts or lists if we use authentic resources, there's, there are structures built into those and features of those authentic texts that actually help people understand them. So that will actually take us further than using textbook style charts and lists and so on. That second piece, creating contexts for comprehension, involves ensuring that comprehension checks are planned and that they are an active and ongoing part of the language learning experience. So we really want when teachers design learning experiences and they're designing for a day when they are going to provide some input to be really thoughtful about what chunks can we break that input into and what would be a series of checks for understanding that we might use after each chunk so that the teacher knows that they're doing okay but also so that the learner knows that they're getting it and it's okay if we move on, or if not, we're going to reteach. And the third component was creating comprehensible interactions where learners are provided language to ask for help in the target language, to help them stay in the target language throughout the learning experiences because we want the learners to be using the language as well, not just the teacher. And another piece of this, because it's, it's scary, for the learners sometimes. They, they're scared to make a mistake and we're trying to put them in these interactions. So another piece of this is embedding and developing and fostering a growth mindset among all of the learners in the room with us so that errors are recognized as a part of the learning process. So with all of that in mind, we're going to take a look at those 
high quality project based learning experiences that we just heard about, but just through the lens of that first high leverage teaching practice, facilitating target language comprehensibility. And for our listeners, just so you know, and our viewers, um, there, the, our guests will answer the questions. It's very free flowing. So it won't necessarily be a question directed to a particular person between Rachel and Adam. So here's the first question. As you consider the project-based language learning experience that you just shared with us, what are some of your go-to strategies to facilitate target language comprehensibility for your learners? I'll go ahead and start. Um, so in, in, in terms of talking about the water project, uh, we have a little bit of uh, the benefit of kids who already speak some Chinese or and actually have, have very good listening skills. So we don't have to do a lot in terms of scaffolding. But that said, um, uh, uh, myself and our teachers, we just can't go in and start saying about conservation and recycling and reusing water and not wasting because uh, these are words that, they, that students may have heard before but may, may not have full control over. So we often and try to to, to start a topic just simply engaging students with some simple Q and A to access their, their basic knowledge of, of a topic. And and uh, as I mentioned before, our kids have been learning about water issues in our school in many different classes for some years. So it's easy to start out with the questions um, saying that we're going to be looking at water issues in Chi in Chinese class. So what do you understand about uh, about uh, conserving water and then saying that we're conserving then you paraphrase and say uh, that you don't waste water and that you, you don't use too much water and then ask students to say what are ways that they do this in, in their homes and then the students may just end up using simple language to say well when I take a shower I try to take a short shower and not use so much water and then uh, the teacher could go on and say that's a great strategy this is a great way to conserve water and then we introduce the phrase jie yue yong shui, the way in Chinese to say to conserve the usage of water and uh, and then also support, uh, using this embedded in uh, uh, Google Slides, knowing that, we're, we, that we want to touch on these vocabulary items to show them these, these words as we go along, to, to show the pinyin, which is the romanization, the, the, the spelling using Roman letters of these, of these sounds, and some pictures without giving them any English, because we're again an immersion school, we don't want to, to use English, but showing something that might uh, to, to demonstrate um, uh, uh, that idea of, of conservation. Um, and then, uh, then we keep on building these slide decks day by day, recycling ones we've done before and adding new pictures to, to build on, on these as well, just in the, in the beginning. And then uh, we also have students uh, have to write down in their notebooks new words that they're hearing uh, or seeing in the Google Slides along with our, our daily can-do statements. So the students will know from the beginning of the lesson that our can-do is to, is to get some basic Basic vocabulary or understanding some basic things about uh, water usage and, con and conserving water, these sorts of things. So that's just a, a, um, a couple strategies uh, to, to, to start the unit. So I'm going to jump in really quickly. Basically, what a really powerful strategy is using the student's prior knowledge as a foundation on which to build new knowledge. Um, and supporting that with visuals and maintaining target language. Rachel, did you have anything you'd like to add on that? Yeah, it's so funny. I was going to say, Adam, you're stealing all the things that I have in my notes. But yeah, um, activating prior knowledge was definitely something that I tried to do through having my students um, work together with their teleattendant partners and just getting discussing children's books, getting into this idea of finding out what's popular in terms of Brazilian children literature. So this kind of um, getting to know things and thinking about their own experiences. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is don't be afraid to reuse, revisit, reread, and rewatch things. Sometimes we treat it, okay, we've read that text, it's over. You know, go back, reread, um, watch the video again. Those can be things that can really aid their comprehension. Um, the other thing, like I mentioned and I shared, is rubrics. So this is especially helpful if you really don't want them to break into English all of a sudden. So, you know, they're doing a task and maybe 
you want to help them have some of that language to discuss what they're discussing, build a rubric for it, and you know, give them those little gambits, those little pieces of the language, so as they're working on the task, they can stay in the target language. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I really liked what you said about rereading, reusing. I, I've joked with teachers when I talk to them about the work, when we're talking about literacy strategies, for example, and my students end up rereading an authentic text, for example, possibly up to seven times, but with a different purpose and for different tasks. And so they never seem to catch on that I got, I tricked them into reading the text again. Um, and their knowledge deepens each time and they catch new language each time that they didn't catch the time before, even if they're focusing on a different task. So you bring up a really good point about not just check marking each authentic resource as we use it as if it's a one and done. I really appreciate that. Exactly. Um, in many project-based language learning experiences, learners encounter a lot of new language. And we kind of touched on this a tiny bit with the previous question, actually. But in this case, what I'm curious about is how do you ensure that learners interact meaningfully and repeatedly with the new words and expressions they will need in order to fully engage in their project-based language learning experiences. Do you want to go first this time, Rachel? Um, sure. Actually, yeah. Some of my strategies were similar. Like I mentioned, the, you know, the revisiting um, texts, videos, whatever it is that you're using in terms of authentic resources or in terms of resources in general. Also, similarly, and this is in my notes, one thing that my students do, just like Adam's students, is keep a Google Docs vocabulary journal. So kind of ongoing, you know, the vocabulary that they need, that they're learning um, throughout the project they're working on. Um, another thing that has helped is sort of kind of just checking in and having them complete these progress reports. So thinking about where they are and what their needs are as well. Um, and yeah, just trying to keep recycling the things they need to know. Of course, in my case, each book was different. So there wasn't necessarily a fixed set of vocabulary that they were gonna learn that I pre-planned, but it was kind of uh, different depending on each individual learner and the shape of their book. You brought up a really good point though that I think not everyone actually associates with helping learners interact with new words and that was the use of self-reflection and self-assessment where the learners are actually you know, are going to take some responsibility for accounting for their language learning needs as well as their language learning progress. Definitely, yeah, that was something I, I tried to build in was sort of the weekly or periodic self-check um, and sort of telling me where they were. I had originally intended to do the project in groups, so I had originally made group reports too, but then abandoned the group idea just for different reasons, and so I just kept it with the individual progress reports. Well, and that comes from just looking at what it is our learners are showing us that they need. Are you able to um, quickly maybe just give one or two sentences about how you noticed or one or two examples of how you noticed their use of self-assessment and reflection helping them to actually kind of hold themselves accountable for, for using new language that they had kind of self-selected because of their books? I was just, just curious if you had oh, an example. I you know, I try to, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no worries. It's just, it's, it was four years ago. <laughs> so right? I know. It's a little bit hard to remember, but I'm sure if I went back and kind of combed through things, I could yeah. find an instance for sure. Right. Where students were really like getting deeper knowledge of the words that they needed for their stories. And then, you know, even, or even seeing that starting to become part of how they communicated after that project was over but they still owned those words and their their facility and ease with which they could use some of those turns of phrase in you know the work they did after that for example right yeah i mean even my um each student also made these little short videos um 
of themselves because not all of them were able to make the trip to Brazil. So they introduced themselves to the learners. And yeah, it's just funny, some of the little expressions that they threw into their video yeah. introductions. Perfect. Thank you. Adam, did you have anything you wanted to add to that topic of helping learners interact meaningfully and repeatedly with the new words? Absolutely. Um, actually, I started answering this question uh, from a participant in the chat uh, while uh, Rachel was, was presenting. But uh, we use a number of online tools to extend uh, learning activities for students, either to use in class or outside of class when they're at home. Uh, the one that, that's, uh, that I want to talk about, and I know Nicole has written about extensively, is Flipgrid, which is now a free tool uh, from a sponsorship by Microsoft where kids can, uh, where actually teachers can present present a question or a video or a prompt and then kids will go online without even needing to um, uh, to create an account and be able to create their own uh, short video response or if they don't want to video themselves they can just have, an, uh, have a, a spoken response to a prompt so uh, just again going back to the idea of talking about con conserving water after we've introduced that vocabulary we may have a flip grid prompt for all the students saying how or how do you um, uh, uh, conserve water in your home, or what are your some other good ideas? And they all have to go and, and post something. And the nice thing about this as a formative assessment is if that if a student has absolutely no idea how to respond or is flummoxed about using the language, they can see what other students have posted and get some ideas from them. And so we say, sure, please go watch your, your, your classmates, but you have to come up with your own idea. You can't just simply parrot what, what someone else has said. And then we can extend these activities by the next day saying, okay, go in and, and, and watch at least five um, uh, uh, of your classmates' Flipgrid uh, responses, and then go into our LMS and in our discussion forum, please make some comments, generally positive, we don't want criticism here, we're working with middle school students, of course, saying what you liked about their idea and, and maybe some suggestions and how th th they can do things better um, and, and, or, or uh, even uh, modify their idea somewhat to make it even better. So th there's tasks for them to continually use this. And I'll just take one minute as well to, uh, to, to answer. Um, Alice Fagnola had a question about strategies for beginning novice learners. I actually teach a class for our, our parents to learn, learn some Chinese and they're zero beginners. So I, I even use Flipgrid for them to say, go home and talk to your kids. And often they have little kids and say, ask them, what is your name? My name is such and such. And then video cord themselves with their, with their students. And in a sense, this is a little mini project where they get to interact with their kids that way. And you're just doing some basic uh, uh, um, zero beginner uh, uh, learning activities in Flipgrid and or other online tools. Yeah, it's a really excellent point that we want our learners to see our content, which is world languages, and then we tend to bring in other content areas, you know, as part of what we do in world languages. We don't want them to think that that stops when the class ends or when it's a vacation period. So we want to provide opportunities for our learners to continue to engage in the target language with target language materials using the resources that are available and yeah i absolutely love flipgrid i've used it also to have students have asynchronous conversations with people overseas because we can't manage the time difference at all so we can never be online at the same time um, but this allowed our students to talk to their peers in france and actually get a a reply directly back um, and also when the students give feedback you know you were saying the importance of helping them give positive feedback and making suggestions and another thing I used to like to ask students to do is or perhaps ask a question to the person um, whose project you're you're looking at to help maybe um, you know to, to help them ask them a helpful question to take their learning in another direction or go deeper um, how do you clarify what learners are expected to understand and do so that they can focus on the concepts and the knowledge and the skills that are central to the content for their project-based language learning experiences without trying to understand every word because i think we all know those students who although they don't know every single word in their native language or native or home languages if they have more than one it suddenly bothers them a great deal 
that they don't know every word they hear or see in the languages that they're learning. So what strategies do you use to help them focus on what they do need to be able to do and understand and not stop their own learning when they hit a word they don't know? I'll go ahead and start. Um, I already mentioned that in, in our classes, we always have daily can-do statements posted at the beginning. And in fact, we even require our students to write down the can-do can statements in their notebooks. So they're processing what it is, and then we have them uh, uh, say it out chorally and make sure they understand what it is. So the, the kids know what the focus of the lesson will be, and there isn't necessarily the, the expectation that they're going to understand every single word. They just have to know what they need to do at the end. Um, but but at the same time, we have to, to, to sequence our activities so there's some level of formative checks or comprehension checks uh, that, that show that, that the students are, are, have, have, have gained the input they need or process it somehow or at, the, at, at some level of being able to do an output task with, with that. Um, so so our, our classes are, are very interactive in, in that all of our um, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about their classroom arrangement. We have pods of, of students all in, in groups of four or sometimes three if it's a smaller group. And sometimes the work is that they just are talking amongst themselves. So for a student to, to stand up and share an idea in front of all of the other 21 or 22 students, for the shy students that might be too hard to do, but then they at least can do it in their small group and then maybe have to, to complete uh, um, uh, just a little exit ticket to show that they've understood what it is if they're if they're too shy to speak up um, or it could just be simply be, be more process oriented as we go more deeply into the project where the students have to take different roles in terms of how they're uh, engaging with the material and uh, filling things out in a wiki project space or uh, or, or creating some sort of a, um, a, a physical document or a poster or what have you um, on, on a day-to-day -day basis Thank you. Did you have anything you'd like to add to that, Rachel? Um, yeah, I mean, not too much. I think Adam hit a lot of great points. I think, you know, sort of a lot of this has to do with the discourse community that you kind of shape in your class and making them not afraid to take risks. You know, also in, I think it was Tony and maybe Christine touched on this too, um, in the podcast is um, really, looking at how you treat their errors or don't treat their errors. So making them feel, you know, safe and comfortable in what they're doing. Um, I think that's also an important part of having them feel like um, they can get a handle on the project and feel comfortable with project based uh, language learning. So I think it's something you kind of need to foster in your classroom from the beginning. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I really appreciate how both of you basically touched back on a couple of aspects from the description of the first high leverage teaching practice. Um, one of the ones that, that came up was that importance of an ongoing active sequence of checks for understanding. And the other one was um, the growth mindset and really fostering that among the students and helping them maintain that because it's not something they necessarily will do naturally.